Well, good evening. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to the Buck Stops here, sponsored by Buck Sanitary Service. Um, I understand if you have to go to the bathroom and uh, you see a porta potty from another company, you're not going to wait for that company. You're going you're to use it. But what I'm they sponsor our show. So what you can do is if you're having a party or a function or some kind of a get together and uh, you know that you like the content that we provide, um, please uh, talk to Bucks. Scott and Lisa are so great about sponsoring our show. They let us come up with controversial topics and push them out there so people can talk about them. And there's not a ton of people out there with the guts to do that. So sometimes when you got to flush it down, this is where we go. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about Greater Idaho. This is a move um, that's been around for years, sort of. Uh, for a while, it was the state of Jefferson. Uh, people in rural Oregon and rural Washington and rural California, Northern California, uh, frustrated with the I-5 corridor of Eugene, Salem, Corvallis, and Portland uh, running the state because they have the numbers and people in rural Oregon feeling voiceless like no one's listening to them. And um, so there's a group called Greater Idaho that's trying to do something about it. And this is the first time I've really seen anything really happen um, in so many years of uh, covering this and watching this that um, got a hold of the people and uh, joining us now is Mike McCarter. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Thank so, you for the time, Rick. Oh, you're welcome. I Anytime there's an idea that makes people get kind of crazy, I think it's worth talking about. Um, and and I when I ran for Secretary of State in 2008 and traveled the state, um, visited 36 or 26 of the 36 counties, and my my opponent, the now governor, visited three: Washington, Clackamas, and Mer uh, Multnomah. And I visited 26, and I heard all over those 26 counties that they were voiceless, they had no voice, and they wanted to. They they felt like they that nobody was listening to them. C correct. Correct. They're, we don't have a voice over there. They have their agenda and they're going to drive it as hard as they can, no matter what we say. So tell me about the idea. What would this do so people can kind of have an idea what's going on? Basically, move Oregon's border for a greater Idaho allows people in rural Oregon, southern Oregon, to live where they love the state where the, the land, their homes and everything, but have Idaho's governance over them, Idaho's benefits over them, Idaho, a voice in Idaho. So it's, so it it's not, go ahead, go ahead. It's so, not moving to Idaho. It's, but, but would it then be called not Oregon? It would be called greater Idaho. Just plain Idaho. So it's just, just one plain thing Idaho. greater Idaho. So I see yes. it's, I put this out yesterday and you saw some of the comments because I sent that to you so you'd know. But it seems like a lot of people are really nervous about they don't want Oregon to change. They don't want to lose part of Oregon, even if they don't live there. Right, right. I'm a born and raised Oregonian, 73 years, except for the seven years during the Vietnam War when I served there. I came back home to Oregon. I love Oregon. I'm diehard green, but I think Oregon has gone off the cliff. And if Portland is any example of that, there's my proof of what's going on up there. Um, we've got to do something about it. I'm going to continue to fight to change Oregon, to bring back the conservative values that we used to have. But there's got to be a plan B out there. And I'm just not willing to go down with the ship if it sinks. So what about what about the more liberal points to, to bring both sides together? Because, you know what I mean? We also have a very liberal state, but we have some conservative folks in all different parts of the state. Is it is it bigger than that conservative thing? Is it more? It seems to me, Mike, that this is more about um, people not feeling like their voices are being heard in the most rural places in Oregon, whether that's a liberal voice or a conservative voice or a libertarian voice or a moderate voice, there seems to be, they seem to get drowned out by the population center. And there's not a lot of representation when you're living in Rome, Oregon, and 
you have you know 12 votes in the whole town and people are deciding how things are going to happen for you. Oh, agreed. Agreed. 78% of the population and the vote is in the Willamette Valley. That leaves 22% in the rest of Oregon. Those decisions that are being made in Salem are being made based on the population in, in the Willamette Valley. Where does that leave us out here? Um, you know, we'd like to sit down and talk, but there is, there, they don't want to talk. They have their, their social experiments that they want to continue with and they want to have free this and, and allow people to burn buildings down and stuff like that. I tell you what, those folks better not come over to Eastern Oregon. They're going to, they'll have a nice warm reception. So Nicole, one of our folks on here, who's a regular wants to know what topics do you feel not heard on? Everything, everything, water rights, that's a big concern over here. Uh, right now, we're in a, in a terrible water so, uh, shortage, but I hate to say it, but because of a particular type of frog, they're draining all the reservoirs so that that frog has the water and the farmers have one third the water they need around Madras right now. One third of the water. And, you know, nobody cares. Nobody listens to it. Um, that forestry, the shutdown logging, you know that over the last 25 years, we've lost almost all of our log mills out here. Uh, they'd rather see things burn down than they would harvest. So it, it, it's a number of issues there. So Mike, I remember one of my most interesting interviews I've ever done in my life and I've never forgotten it was a rancher in Rome, Oregon. And uh, mm -hmm. she and her husband were cowboys, cow women, cowgirls, whatever you call them. Uh, they, they ranched uh, cattle. And I said to her, she lived on the Oahe River. And she mm -hmm. said, you know, Rick, the environmental community came out and told us we had to fence off our, our river so that our cows couldn't drink out of the water, that they've been doing that for generations. They never talk about the, the water lakes that we've built man-made out in the desert for elk and for our cattle. And she says, and then I go to Portland to fight this, and I stand on the banks of the Willamette River in downtown Portland and see 30 miles of river encased in concrete and pollution, and you come to rural Oregon to tell me how I'm supposed to manage my river when you can't even manage your own. Agreed. There's a there's another issue that that seems to be I'm hearing about it in the background, that the governor wants to turn over all of our forest land, private, private land now, to a commission to tell those people how to take care of it so it doesn't catch on fire. Well, let me tell you, the state doesn't take care of their own forest land to keep it from burning down. And they're going to come over and tell us how to do it. So the my other issue with go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt the, you. The other issue with water is that Oregon looks at your water rights. The water is not your water. That water is the state water. Idaho says your water rights are the same as your property rights with it. Now, is there does there have to be some negotiations? You you just can't use it all up. There's got to be some system in place to take and make sure that everybody's got the water they need. But, you know, I, I heard about it in agriculture years ago. They're getting ready to put meters on the wells because they want to regulate and or charge you for the water. So, it, so, so, Mike, let me tell you, let me ask you this. So the way this would work, the way you're looking at it, you have to go to each county with a petition and get enough signatures to do what? Is this get this on a ballot? Yeah, the whole idea here is we want to hear what the citizens of each county want. This is not a vote to succeed or to remove the county from the state of Oregon because the, the county doesn't have that kind of authority. The whole idea here is say, okay, this is the start of the process to start looking into, is it beneficial to say move Jefferson County from a county of Oregon to a county of Idaho. You get 17 counties that all vote positive on this, that we want to look into it. 
We want to see what the differences are. Take that to our state representatives, our state senators, and take it to Salem with the support of the citizens, because this is a grassroots movement. This is not out-of-state people trying to tell Oregonians what to do. These are Oregonians that are voting for this, and that should be the way it is. When we have a problem, we should take it up from the bottom up, not from the top down. So, Mike, the way that what you're looking at right now, as I understand from looking at the map in there, is it would be basically Madras over um, to the east. Um, Bend would still be in Oregon, and everything east of that would be here. And then it's Eugene, south of Eugene, Coos County, Douglas County, and all the way down into Redding, California, and then over to Idaho. So you have to get... At, at, go ahead. Actually, actually, it's only Oregon. Oh, it We're doesn't have on, okay. Yeah, it doesn't include California right now because California couldn't be part of Idaho because there is no Idaho around California. So if Oregon makes that border adjustment, then you can shift into a phase two. And those counties are more conservative than a lot of the Oregon, Eastern Oregon counties. So let but me I, ask you a question. Somebody, I, Susie she, uh, has a really great question. How could we stop this? What would need to happen? Not, to, not, to stop. I think I'm going to guess that what Susie means is not how do we stop you from doing this, but how do people in rural Oregon, how, how do we make it so they feel heard um, and not just feel so that they are heard so that this doesn't have to happen? I'm guessing that's what Susie means, I hope. Well, you know, there's there's all kinds of roadblocks that are in 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 there that we we don't even know what's going to happen with this but what we're doing is we're allowing those citizens in the counties to say okay we want to start looking at it if you get 17 counties in oregon that are voicing we want to look at becoming part of idaho that sends a message to salem that sends a message to them there's some unhappy people up there now they may not do it a doggone thing about it but at least we're voicing our opinion then, and it's getting out and it's going nationwide. So Susie also asked, will the representatives listen? And I think Susie, the problem as uh, that I recognized when I was back there is they don't have enough, that they're, they're a huge land area. Let's look at Harney County. Harney County has, is the biggest, isn't it the biggest county in Oregon, Mike? I think it is. It, yeah. Yes, it I is. Think, I think uh -huh. it is. And it has 7,100 and some people in it, which is the size of Cresswell, Oregon, in the entire mm -hmm. county. So they don't have a lot of representation for that, you know, that, 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 those people. Whereas Portland, Eugene, and us have tons of representation. So when everybody votes, where does rural Oregon get left? Um, kind of in the dust, right? Correct, correct. But we've got state representatives and state senators coming on board. And I think there's a group that are sitting out there watching. Is this really a grassroots movement? Is it going to get traction? Are, are they going to get someplace? And why are we going to hear about it? If we hear about it, then we're going to start helping too. Because every citizen in Oregon has a voice. And if they make that voice known, there's going to be some movement. So, so um, it's not as easy as people think because you're getting some blowback from, from some counties um, with leadership. It's not easy. You've been kind of pushing Coos County a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, I can't remember the other one you told me, but it's not, um, th this is a change that really, you saw the, the comments I had just on the tees. This really gets sure. Oregonians riled, which is kind of, yeah. is. can I just, I, I'm just going to ask you this, Mike, and you can say yes or no, but isn't that kind of what you're trying to do? Get people talking what? and listening because you guys have been screaming for a long time and nobody's really listening and now you're going, okay, tough shit, we're going to do this. Well, yeah, yes, that is, but that's not our priority. Our priority is to start looking at this and start seeing, is it is it a viable move? Now, it could get stopped in the state legislature, but we've got good response coming out of Idaho's representation.
that they want to see it, that they like that idea. And we're also hearing about some of our, our, our Oregon representatives, too, are starting to talk about it and get on board. County commissioners are talking about it. And, yeah, it, it, it's not going to happen fast, but it's not going to be 70 years like the state of Jefferson. I mean, this this is going to be done in three or four years or it's not going to happen. So and it would take an act of Congress ultimately to make this happen. Absolutely. And they say, well, when when was the last time this happened? 1863, West Virginia and Virginia. But right now, there's 14 counties in Illinois that are voting to move from Illinois to Indiana. This is not the only place that's happening in the United States. There is an unrest between rural conservative people and liberal urban dwellers. And I so, would say dwellers in a bad way. So Nicole asked a really good question, and I wonder how, if you knew. Um, she says, I don't think that any of the Eugene and Portland areas would oppose the move. And Nicole, I will disagree with you because I've had lots of Eugene friends on here. People are pretty, pretty, pretty um, loyal to Oregon and they don't want it to change. But she has a great point. Would Portland and Eugene and the Valley benefit from not having all of you folks? Absolutely. You know, we, we've done a lot of the figure work behind the scenes. On average, an Oregonian um, wage earner, the state would benefit $324 per wage earner just by releasing the counties. So all of a sudden, Oregon, even though it's smaller, it's focused around the Willamette Valley, it becomes quite rich and it doesn't have to send money east or south to help the counties out. It can keep it there and do what they want to do. But wouldn't, but wouldn't um, the state lose a lot in terms of all that land? I know most, I mean, I, mean, I know most of Oregon is federal land, but wouldn't there be a loss, um, some kind of financial loss from um, losing all you folks on the, on the east side? I'm asking. I don't believe so. I don't, I don't believe so. And in the figures that we look at, um, the, the counties that we're dealing with are basically about the same average wage earner as rural Idaho counties. So it's, it's a similar one-on-one uh, -on -one with Idaho. But Oregon, the Willamette Valley, in a lot of places subsidizes counties over this way that don't like you're talking Harney County with it. I mean, if you're going to live in Harney County, that that county can't be funded by the tax base because there's not enough tax base coming out of it with 7,000 people. It's got to be supported by the state. And so all of a sudden, they don't have to support that anymore. Now, the, the plus side, if this move takes place, all of a sudden, rural Oregon starts to boom because Idaho, they're timber friendly. They're not anti-timber at all. They know how to deal with it. Also, if Coos Bay is involved in it, there's a deep water port that becomes oh, all of a sudden. Idaho. So Idaho all of a sudden has a deep water port that is kind of yeah. unutilized in Oregon because they have Portland. So now you've just created a market for that. Huh. Why, why fight the Columbia River system to ship their products out of Idaho? All of a sudden, Idaho is not a landlocked state anymore. It's right on the Pacific Rim. Don't you think that there could be east-west highways built, rails built, to ship grain, timber, all of the all the Idaho products to the Pacific Rim? It, it could be a boom. So, Mike, here's a great question from Ashley Hicks. Mm -hmm. He's a um, city councilor down in Roseburg. How about everyone work <laughs> together instead of dividing us further? I, I agree with you. I totally agree with you, but I don't think the other side wants to work together. I, I, I talked to a lot of the county commissioners and stuff, and we would all like to. Again, I was born and raised right outside of Portland and Gresham. On a, I love Portland. Uh, I love that area. I, I just retired from the Willamette Valley four years ago. And I tell you what, it, I'm frustrated. 
I, you know, it's a shame with what's going on up there in Portland. And I don't want to see it in the rest of the state at all. But, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to work with anybody. Um, I ran for a, a county precinct person position and didn't win with it. That's fine. Next year, I'll try again and I'll work harder at it. But I, I believe in being involved in it and seeing if we can get it back together. But again, if you got 78% of the vote coming out of the Willamette Valley and they're pushing their policies, they're pushing their taxes, they're pushing their carbon crap and things like that, how can we exist? We've got to go with it. We're, we become just slaves over here. And, and do a lot of people over there that you talk with feel that way? Yeah, they do. They, I travel all over Eastern Oregon. Do I run into the diehard Oregonians? I'm a diehard Oregonian. I'm a duck fan. I mean, I'm, I'm dyed green on it. I, I love the state. And there's some people that say, nope, I'm an Oregonian. I don't want to have anything to do with Idaho. You know what I tell them? I said, sign the petition and vote no. If that's your choice, sign the petition. Let's get a vote of the people. Isn't that what we're supposed to do in a representative government? Uh, the, pe the people are supposed to stand up and say yes or no. So, Mike, you, at the risk of sounding, uh, oh, who cares? It's my show. Um, <laughs> so, so what I think sometimes the valley dwellers like myself don't understand until you get out there is how frustrated people really are in the eastern part of Oregon. Um, because years and years of not being heard, and this isn't just conservative values. This is just, you know, people, I went to the Diamond um, Hotel and these teachers who run the Diamond Hotel, this lady says, Rick, you know, we're Democrats and we just don't, nobody's listening to us over here and we don't have, you know, and we're just tired of it. And I think that's what people, it's really easy for people to go, well, the majority rules and that's how it works. Well, when when you're when you're living on land, somebody else like on our, one of the pages of my comment saying, uh, somebody said, "Well, let's have a move to Idaho." Well, some of you, some of the folks in rural Oregon have lived on that land that their great great grandparents lived on for 150 to 200 years. So we, yep. it's not that they want to leave their land; it's just that they want to be heard. So what you're saying is. Let's get these petitions out, people sign them, and then let's vote as a state to at least get people in rural Oregon and urban Oregon, because they'd have to vote too, right? Well, does it start first well, the petition in the counties then, right? Yeah, it's just it's just petitions over in eastern Oregon and southern Oregon and part parts of central Oregon too with it. And, sure. and it's like I say, it just opens up the discussion. That's all it's about. It's not about Okay, because we vote yes, we're not going to be part of Oregon anymore. That's not what it's about. So really, it's, it's, saying, sending a message, it's sending a message to everyone in the state of Oregon that we're dissatisfied, we want to be heard, we're willing to, to, to do this in order to make it better, and now can we please have some kind of a discussion? Agree. Agree. But what we're running into now... I, and I don't know what age bracket you're in, Rick. You, you look you look pretty young to me compared oh, to myself. I, I absolutely <laughs> adore you. <laughs> yeah, I'm 25, going on 61. <laughs> okay, but there were day there were years where you could sit down across from somebody, and and agree to disagree. You could talk to each other. You could say debate issues. Right now, the way things are going. If I tried to go into Portland and talk to somebody there, the first thing that would happen is I'd be called a name and probably not a good name at all. And what's happened with our ability to sit down and talk? It, it's, it's like we're enemies. We're not enemies. We just have different values and different views. And we should be able to share them and come to some consensus. But right now, it doesn't seem to be going that way. Do you think part of this too? I'm just this is super fun conversation um, for me. I think because my family's from Baker City and they're they're 
pioneers, which I know is kind of a nasty word for some now, but um, you know, they came here and uh, set up a cattle ranch out there. And what I found in visiting rural Oregon is there's people, you guys are experts at what you do out there. And because you don't have a vote or a voice, people in Portland have come up with ideas. You don't get to be included in those ideas and they just force new rules and regulations, not asking you, well, we've been doing this for a long time, taking care of it. It's almost kind of like um, treating you like you're not educated enough to do, to take care of the land or the people or whatever. That's my opinion. Or take care, or take care of ourselves. Right. You know, but I tell you what, the people over here, are the hardest working folks. Not that the people in Will Willamette Valley don't work hard, but I mean, these folks, they live out in a lot of, a lot of places where they, they don't, they don't have all the amenities. They don't have all the restaurants to go to and all the other things that, that, that we have in the Willamette Valley. And sometimes it's pretty harsh living where they're at. And it's not because, uh, they're dumb or stupid or rednecks or whatever you want to think of them. And they make that choice because they want that freedom. And the word I hear with move Oregon's border for greater Idaho, the biggest thing I heard was, uh Oh, I've got some hope. Now I've got some hope that somebody's going to listen. And then maybe there is a change taking place. And you know, it, it, it just, it melts me. What I hear that. What I've noticed with another project my wife and I work on and stuff too is a lot of people in rural Oregon work two and three jobs. That's just normal. So yep. what, what I noticed with a lot of people we meet and talk with when COVID-19 hit, it wasn't as devastating for them because it's like, well, then we just find ways to innovate and create new work and find different jobs because that's how you live your life when you live east of Bend and, and south of Eugene and, and, west of or east of madras um you you you're that's just it's not whining or bitching it's what you do and no. carol no it would not include eugene just so you know i saw your comment up here and i wanted to make sure you know that yeah in um march 8th right before the state was shut down when we launched our our first rally which was in douglas county at the douglas county fairgrounds there it was incredible there was there was four to five hundred people there Wow. with it. And, and I, I didn't know it, but there was also some of the county commissioners sitting there listening to it too. And the media was there with it. It was unreal to hear these people talk, it, just to hear the, their frustration. Then all of a sudden, COVID-19 hit, things shut down, and the governor says, okay, it's not fair that Eastern Oregon kids where there's no COVID-19 can go to school when the kids in, in the Valley don't go to school. So we're going to take stop school completely. We're going to shut down all the towns. And this is early on when you didn't have a bunch of cases. Oh, that. oh yeah. There, there were there for months, there was four or five counties that had no cases, but they were shut down just like the Metro area with it. And those places that were shut down, they're economically fragile. I mean, right. really fragile. And so you start shutting businesses down there and, and coming in there with OSHA and saying, you got to wear a mask. You might have a problem with some so of those places. Trying Nicole, to do Nicole wants to know, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but I want you to talk. I still haven't heard how the counties moving are going to fund their services. Is Idaho willing to pick up the tab? And yeah. this is. Well, that's it. This is opening up those kinds of discussions. I hear yeah. about those questions and I hear the questions about PERS. I hear the questions about school funding, uh, state police, roads, all those kind of things. This is opening up that, that whole area of discussion with it. So this is not just saying it's a done deal if somebody vote if a county votes yes. That has that's not what this is about. So you're trying this to get this is about to Get the conversation. We're trying to get it started. Yeah. And, and, and you really want people in Oregon to understand um, your frustration and that you're willing to do this because that's how serious it is. And you've been saying you're frustrated for as long as I've been a journalist in this community. That's been th like over 30 years. 
Um, and like I said, when I traveled the state running for office, that is all I heard was nobody in mm -hmm. Salem, nobody in the Valley listens to us. And um, so I think we have a, you know, if we're, if Oregon is one big family, I would, I would say that we have a dysfunctional family and we're failing to listen to everybody in our communities. And we have one mindset that seems to be going this direction. And we need to remember that there's a lot of people in other parts of our state um, that are also Oregonians. Um, and yet, if you go to Jordan Valley and you go to Rome <laughs> And you go to, I don't know about Ontario, but when I've asked people in those other communities, they feel like they're already Idahoans, if or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. I, you know, they mm -hmm. do, they say, we're, we're really more a part of Idaho than we are a part of Oregon. So it's, it's um, we, we've got a, we've got a gap. We have some of our kids in Oregon. <laughs> if we're children, and this is a big state, we got a lot of kids who aren't feeling like we're, um, they're not feeling the love of being listened to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think how do you know, people when I, when I, go ahead. ahead. You know, I there there is there's a thing about okay, I'm a diehard Oregonian. I have Oregon in my butt. I love Oregon. I love the uh, Portland area, but do I love my freedom versus the name? Is the name Oregon or is the name Idaho freedom? I want to live where I can make my own choices within the law. And Idaho is there right now. Could it change somewhere down the road? Absolutely, it could. But still, right now, um, we don't have the freedom in Oregon. We don't. We're losing it month after month. And uh, I'm out there fighting it. I'm trying to see what we can do. But Doggone it. I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and just let it go. So where do people find the petition? Tell them about your Facebook page and your website or whatever information you have. That'd be awesome. www.greateridaho.org. www. And that's the same. Yep. Greateridaho.org. And it's okay. the same thing for our you. Facebook page. Oh, and that's the same for your Facebook page? And then that tells where they can get a petition if they'd like to sign it. And can so this is basically if for those of us in the valley, we're not playing this round. <laughs> no, nope, nope, nope. it's the same thing with Deschutes County too in Bend. They're not playing either. Somebody asked earlier, how come Bend's not included in the new or in the new Idaho? For one thing, I don't think Oregon wants to get rid of that cash cow. <laughs> ben, ben makes a lot of money for the state of Oregon. So, so Mike, you're 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 willing to get rid of all the cash cows in the valley and just for your freedom? Really? Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, yeah. Really? It's that it's important. Not all, it's that not important. all about money. Yeah. But there so are some good where, where'd that value come from? I don't understand. I don't I don't hear much about that. What do you mean? Follow the money trail? No, <laughs> no, it's, it's, these people over here have a different set of values, family, faith, land, the, you know, freedom on it. Um, it's not about getting rich quick because it ain't happening over here with a lot of the people. They just hardworking folks that, that love what, where they live and what they do. So a, a, a local guy here, Matt Kendall, is asking the question, any response from Governor Brown in regards to having some kind of roundtable conversation? Is she interested in listening? Uh, let's, let's be truthful. No, I don't think she's interested in listening. She's got too many battles she's fighting right now with it. At some point, I would sit and talk with her. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But uh, she might not be a real happy because I took her to federal court a month ago. <laughs> God, Mike, so, you're, yeah. you're just a troublemaker, aren't you? Well, you know, her, her lockdown policies have restricted my, our First Amendment rights to go out and to collect signatures on the petition. Correct? Uh, I mean, how common sense. Yeah, I mean... 
Who wants to walk up to somebody with a mask on and, and, and catch COVID-19 by signing a petition? Or can we go to a fair someplace and sign them? Or a rodeo? Or an event? Because there isn't any of those anymore. So uh, we so actually, all complaint. Really? So how far is yeah, that? Uh, it got denied. <laughs> and so we, we refiled another motion on it with more proof of what's going on out there and have not heard what the results of that are yet. So it's, and there's also two, two uh, uh, circuit court cases going on, one in Lake County and one in Crook County on the petitions. Oh, now can you so, tell us about that? Because they, do you want to get into that? Sure, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Basically, we've at, asked the judge to review the decision from the county clerks why they refused our petition request. And that's that's, that's basically Primeville and Lake County. Yep. 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 Those two. Yeah, those two. And and we're not at war with it. I go down and talk to them all the time and stuff. It's just the process. We're willing to do it within the framework of the law the right way with petitions, with citizen signing a petition, with legal, if that's what comes into play. We're not out there painting buildings, burning down stuff, endangering people. So That's um, not the way we do it. Mike, so Deborah offers an idea. She says you can get signatures using social media. She's she, You should look into that. There's ways to do it online. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. We have. Mike. Yeah, there is an East East signature out there. Yes. Mike, thank you so much for making the time uh, to come on. Hey. And, um, you know, whether, who, who knows, just the fact that you have the guts to bring it out. And, um, you know, and, and I think all of us in the Valley, I hope this shows us that we, you know, we have fellow Oregonians who have ideas that might work. You know, let me give you a really quick story real fast here. I went to, um, oh gosh, how come I, 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 you know, when you turn 61, you just start losing your mind. I can't remember any talk to me. where I went to a charter school in near summer Lake in, um, oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't remember the name. Paisley? There. Yes. Thank Paisley? you. And Paisley 30 years ago started a charter school there. And they now have a, well, up until, you know, the COVID reaction, they had over 140 students on the I-5 corridor taking classes online from their school, from Paisley. They had 13 international students every year come there, and they're using that money to pay to keep their school open to, to, so they can keep a school open to educate their own children. And I thought, Yep. Where the hell did you come up with that? What an innovative idea. And I said that to the teacher there. And she says, Rick, we're just full of all kinds of innovation. And I think sometimes in the mm -hmm. Valley, we fail to look beyond our borders or what makes sense to us, to what others are doing. And maybe that's a conversation we need to have as a state is start looking to rural Oregon where people do come up with some wonderful ideas that can work. Um, I can see where some in the Valley would go against that mm -hmm. because it's a charter school, but we got to keep our minds open because COVID reaction has changed everything and we got to find new ways to do things. And maybe we can find those by going to rural Oregon. Mikey. Yep. Thank you for being here. Um, thanks You're for welcome, taking your time. You guys just consider it. Think about other people. Empathy. Yeah. Kind of the topic yeah. of the day. All right, Mike, I'm going to take you off here for a second and say a few words to close my audience out. Thank you again. Thank you, Rick. And I, I enjoy the questions and the comments that are coming from over there. Well, and what they you, don't bother me. Okay, buddy. And what you can do still to keep your message going is go on this page and you can answer each of these people if they have a question that you know the answer to and you want to talk to them because my audience is very big on conversation. So these are people, even if they scare you, um, like Bill Daniels will probably scare the hell out of you, but he's a really good guy. Bill, I'm kidding you. But anyway, go answer him. Okay? <laughs> All right. Thanks, buddy. So, okay. 
So we want to thank Scott and Lisa Weld from uh, Buck Sanitary Service because they let us bring stuff like this. And maybe you say it'll never happen, but can you hear the part where this is a bunch of people who are super frustrated because they don't have a voice? And if we're empathetic, which we've been talking a lot about empathy lately, that means you can put yourself in their place and feel what that feels like. How do you feel when you don't have a voice? How do you feel when other people tell you how you have to run your land that you've been managing for 200 years in your family? How do you feel? How are you going to educate people if you think they're not doing it the right way when you haven't even found out what they do in the first place and you just legislate what changes and things that you shove down their throat? That's how they feel. And how would you feel if you're empathetic, which so many people say we're empathetic. So if we are an empathetic Oregon, we have some of our citizens who don't feel the love. So maybe we need to start by listening and trying to feel what that would feel like to me to feel that way. Scott and Lisa, thanks again from Buck Sanitary Service. Thanks for all your comments, you guys. Um, let's continue the conversation because you know what? It's our Oregon. And we need to make it so it's everyone's Oregon, not just the I-5 Oregon. I'm Rick Dancer. Thanks for joining me. Tomorrow we are at a new client. We're at a Chris Dental. Um, we're going to go show you the cool. They have this spray. Well, I'd ruin it if I told you. But they have some really cool stuff going on. And then on Wednesday, we're at Elements Health Club. Thursday, any lab test now out in Vanita, they have a food cart out there and we're going to show you, take you kind of out and party a little bit. So um, if you guys have not been involved in our Pacific Northwest Backstories contest, get away the taste of Redmond. It ends tonight. So go over to our PNW page, register, because uh, this is to, we're going to win a trip to Redmond when travel is better and safer. Uh, but we just want to make sure that you're out there looking for it. All right. If you have any comments or suggestions for Mike, uh, get a hold of him on his page. He's really easy to talk to. All right. Um, that's it, man. It's almost five o'clock. I think I'm good. God, you know, wearing masks is really bad on my hair. I'm just saying it's important.